Welcome to Life Activated. I'm Mari Roberts, corporate gal, gone rad energy healer and psychic guide. The intention of this podcast is to be a supportive space that empowers you to live your passions now, encouraging you to be uniquely you and to trust your intuition. On this podcast, you're going to hear from guests who are just like you. The difference is they figured out how to bring their passions into their life. To find out more, please visit me at marirobertslife.com. Hello, hello. Welcome again to another episode of Life Activated. I am so happy to have you here. We have a beautiful, amazing guest today. And I am privileged to call this human, this magical human, a friend. I've called you magical so many times because you are truly magical. And so let's just say a magical friend, magical being. <laughs> How about that intro? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So please welcome Karen Lepage to the show. Karen, I'm going to let you take it over and just introduce yourself. Tell everyone a little bit about who you are. And don't forget to mention a little bit of the, the witchy woo stuff uh, for those people who are interested because we do have those listeners here. Good. It's something I <laughs> I share in my professional work even now. Why? I'm so tired of compartmentalizing. There's no need anymore. I'm 50. It's time to just let it all out. Hello. I mean, it's always been time, but yes. Hello. So, well, I hesitate to describe myself by my job, but I am a sewing fairy godmother. I make handmade dreams come true. I am also a professional pattern maker and greater, specializing in inclusivity, a visionary, a mentor, identity affirming tailor and an all around textile magician. I can make anything with my hands. I'm a mom. I'm a witch. I'm a yin yoga trauma informed teacher. I think we should all have a deeper relationship with our wardrobes because they can support us. I'm also a gene keys guide and those things might sound like they're <laughs> chaotic and that maybe they don't go together. I realized today my niche, when anyone says niche down, my niche is just me. And so all of the services I offer and all of the work I'm trying to do in the world is to help people see how beautiful they are and to learn to have a better relationship with themselves and to participate in community. I really think we can make the world a better place if we want to. We just have to want to. I love that. Oh, my big yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. I'm super Sagittarius. I have a, a big stellium, which means more than three planets with five major placements in Sagittarius wow. in um, the 11th house, which is all about community. I'm an Aquarius rising, which means I'm a weirdo, also about community. And I am a Virgo moon. Even though that's an earth sign, it's mutable earth. So there's magic in that as well. I hesitate to say I'm a chameleon because I'm not trying to disguise or fit in. I just feel like I can be <laughs> kind of a connective tissue between multiple kinds of groups. I was yeah. the creative one in a technical field or the technical one in a creative field. And I'm really comfortable in that liminal space now. Yeah. The ownership of it. I don't have to be one thing. I can't. You're not I'm a 6-3 manifesting generator. If you know anything about human design, you know that I've lived many lives in one lifetime, mm -hmm. like old Deuteronomy mm -hmm. from cats. Yeah. You're not meant to be. And this is such a beautiful intro and something I was going to say about you. And I literally have it written down. You have many gifts. And I literally wrote down, you weave your passions through your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is shown by just even how you shared what you do currently. But I think we'll talk a little bit more and people will get to learn more about 
who you are and the things that you've done and how you've lived your passions in different ways. And they'll even understand and hopefully take away that your passions can be different and they can morph throughout life. Yeah. And that you can be all of those things and it's all perfect and good. I agree. Yeah. Something I want to also just call out, if you have seen, especially on social media, me wearing any kind of a tunic, it is because Karen... You're a queen. Yeah. Thank you. Karen has made those for me uh, because I have a vision of living in tunics and caftans in Mallorca. And Karen is helping me to feel beautiful and expressed in caftans and tunics in different ways. And she is magic. Also, because it's truly back to inclusive dressing, right? She makes it so that I can actually find a tunic that fits me. Exactly how you want to. Yeah. Exactly how I want to. I don't have to feel uncomfortable trying to find a tunic that actually fits my body or feel embarrassed about the fact that my size isn't at a store. It's right. Right. I'm so mad at the fashion industry. Nobody fits in clothes at the store. So we all think it's us and it is not us. There's no consistency in sizes across brands. Part of that is so that brands can differentiate themselves. We don't know what body shape a brand is designing for. Sometimes it's internally disjointed. So you could buy something from a company that's made in one factory in some part of the world, and yet they didn't communicate things clearly to another factory in another part of the world. And so same garment, same fabric, same size, totally different fits. That has probably happened to everyone. And yet we, maybe especially our generation, internalize, I think (laughs) the last of the truly toxic um, role models in Gen X. Hopefully that we don't allow that to come back for our communities and our next generations. We're influ- we have the responsibility to influence. But yeah, always, always judging ourselves instead of fighting against what is there and demanding better. I see younger generations demanding better. And I hope that's because we've been a bridge there. Yeah, that's true. So there have been a lot of changes and also it's just the beginning. So to true. How clothing is offered, manufactured, and how we can have a circular, mutual relationship with the garments that we wear. And everything doesn't have to be custom, right? We can mix yeah. everything together and create a little bit of magic through things that are special, bringing them to us so that we can dress how we feel and we can feel how we want to. It right? is so true. It is. We so created two true. things from your imagination that turned into garments. And, and when you said they fit how you want, like one of them you wore for a while and then we changed it, right? Yeah. And so that's the beauty of, you can do that with store-bought clothes too, if you know how to sew or if you know somebody who knows how to sew well. So yeah. I'm not the only person who can do this. And it's my mission in life that I empower and train up as many different people who want to be able to work this morphology magic on garments their own and others. Anybody who wants to, I think, can learn. So yeah, that's my passion. And it has been my whole life. I could never find anything that fit. I guess I have to make it myself. I love it. And that is your passion, but you have so many other passions. Actually, we were literally right before this, we were actually talking. I was complaining about my technical lacks and <laughs> creating a downloadable resource for you. And I can't wait for it too. (laughs) And Karen was like, it's just this simple. This is all you have to do. This is what I used to do in my old career. And so this is what, again, what I love about you, Karen, is I think that you're such a great example of someone who has had multiple expressions of your passion Mm -hmm. Um, or passions in different times of your life. And yeah, 
the way I witness it, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, I witness it from you and that you have allowed them to ebb and flow mm-hmm. and you don't, and maybe you, maybe I'm wrong, but you don't feel guilt about letting one go and moving to the next. No, I don't forget everything I learned. If I did, then maybe I would, I would miss it. I do have a lot of passions and fashion itself is not one of them. Having clothes that are supportive and communicate for us and with us, that is a passion of mine, but fashion Mm. is not one. Mm. I have pretty, as you already heard, healthy dose of disdain for fashion with a capital F. And I did want to make clothes. I have been making clothes since I've been sewing since I was five and I've been making clothes for myself. I started with costumes, but since middle school. And then I started sewing, you know, nicer things for myself in high school. And then I sewed for other people starting at the end of high school and in college to help me pay my expenses. Yeah. And just to repair things because I had to and I wanted to. I couldn't afford to just go buy new things because they were damaged. So I learned to modify them or to repair them or to make them a different size or a different shape. Or, you know, if puff sleeves were out of fashion, I'd just take them off. I think people don't realize they can do that. And so I was just constantly giving myself permission to make things right for me while not going to fashion school, even though I loved making things. I didn't want to be involved in that whole. I knew already when I graduated high school in 1990 that I didn't want to be part of an industry that oppressed women or families and contributed to pollution. I'm always people first. It's an industry that takes advantage of people and as we see our clothing becoming less and less costly, yet material costs are going up all around the world and shipping and you know storage, all of those costs are going up. Where do we think the savings are coming from? They're coming out of someone else's belly. And it doesn't mean that if you are paying more for something that someone who made it got paid more. I think there is a, a need for transparency as far as that's concerned. And there are measures in place now where big brands are signing on to provide that kind of transparency. But it just makes me sick that it's taken giant decades of activism toward this to just get people to show us where their people work and make sure they're eating properly and that kids are allowed to go to school because they don't have to work to support their families because their parents who work at the same factory don't get paid enough. Yeah, there's that the big community heart, the community as in everyone who lives on this planet with us right now. We're responsible for each other. And we also have to be able to take care of ourselves. So it's always a balance. Uh-huh. You know? I don't judge people who buy fast fashion. I judge fast fashion industries. So uh-huh. that's, I want to make that very clear. Yeah. People don't always feel like they have choices. And maybe they don't have choices at certain times in their lives because they have to prioritize survival. So yeah. I'm not judging anybody who makes a decision to, you know, get something at a bargain. You're keeping it out of a landfill, especially if you're buying something on clearance. It's not going to get donated yeah. to somebody who can use it. It's going to be disposed of. Yeah. So I don't see a problem with that. I see a problem with the industries who are raking in profits and not sharing them with the people who made their brand what it is. Definitely creating food for thought in terms of thinking about clothing and what we wear and how we wear it. Not only that, but how can we allow our clothing to have multiple lives in different ways? Yeah. And thinking about the energetics of it too. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. What comes with it? And Mm -hmm. maybe we should all have cleansing rituals when we bring clothes home from the store, but I don't even wash mine first. I just put them on, Mm -hmm. take it out of the bag that came in if it got shipped to my house and put Mm -hmm. it on immediately and probably wear it for three days in a row before, depending on what I spilled on it or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because usually we're excited. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, I got this cute whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love Mm -hmm. it. So I do it too. I want to communicate that it doesn't mean we have to be perfect or that there even is a perfect. There is not. No. So making conscious choices is definitely a passion of mine, but fashion itself, not only in as much as It can help us embody who we want to be. It can serve as a literal physical protection to our skin and our 
bodies. It can feel like a home. It can be comforting. It can express before we say anything with our mouths. It can express who we are. Can kind of serve as a filtering process. Even my oldest child actually taught me this, so I can talk about that later too. Yeah, I wanted to talk about my passions though, because that one has been with me since I've been a little kid. But anything else, I can learn things really quickly, and so I could get excited about something, no matter where I'm working, no matter what I'm doing. I mean, now in my life, right now is the first time I've had one job at a time yeah. for the past few years. Yeah. In my life. And yeah. I say that I'm a freelancer, so I'm actually going to work on site somewhere next week. And I, you know, I do a lot of different things, but I don't work for multiple jobs. You know, I'm not going from working all day at a bookstore to working at Taco Bell overnight from yeah. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah, at yeah, the yeah. 24-hour Taco Bell and then going for a nap and then going back to the bookstore like I used to do. It feels very freeing to be able to pull my passions in together. But even that, even working in a coffee shop, I found a way to learn about coffee, learn what I liked, learn what I didn't like, get really informed so that I could share that information with people who came in. I considered it my job because people are only with me for five or 10 minutes when they come into a coffee shop to have a positive impact on their day. Like Mm -hmm. literally my job to give them some sunshine in the morning or in the evening, Uh not necessarily by the making of the drinks, but by sharing the joy and sunshine, I guess, sometimes that I can bring to work, even if I'm not feeling it on my way in there. I I always managed to find something I loved about it. Like, oh, I wonder what this person's going to, you know, (laughs) order today, or I'd look forward to regulars coming in. And I worked in an architectural firm and I became really interested in the materials that they used, and I could recognize a client's voice on the phone and immediately call them by name. And so those neurodivergent bonuses, we talk a lot about how hard it is to have. I have ADHD, and I just found out last year, and I'm going back in my life and seeing these spider webs connect. And now I'm ready to embrace how that's helped me over the years. And those little things are idiosyncrasies that I thought were just part of my personality and they are. That's why, because I do think differently from other people. So yes, I have a lot of passions. I didn't bring them here. I experienced them and I can always find some always, and probably it's all those Sagittarius placements, right? Like I always say, and it's true, I'm still alive because pure optimism. So I can find something to uh, be interested in at least, if not enjoy and practice in the work that I do. And I love what you said around sort of that always finding passion and always, no matter what you were doing, being able to like dive into it. Sometimes we are in experiences that we may not necessarily desire to be in. And instead of finding ways to embrace them, embrace them, embrace them, (laughs) we get more upset versus looking for. Oh, I mean, I do that too. Yeah. First. Yes. 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 (laughs) But you, you, you definitely have found ways to embrace and say, okay, well, what can I get passionate about? Where can I find the joy in that? Which I think is really lovely. What I'd love to also ask you in that is how do you show compassion for yourself in those moments? You know, okay, I'm making a switch, (laughs) you know, and yeah, I may not like the switch that I've made, or maybe I am excited about the switch that's happening. Um, There's still stuff from before that needs to be done. Yeah. 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 Well, accepting that I'm only one person at a time has gone a long way. Uh toward me being more compassionate with myself. I still believe I'm superhuman sometimes. And instead of rest even dawning on me as an option, I will just switch activities instead of, you know, the activity being sitting down. Uh My dog is not doing well recently. And it's been like having a little toddler at home, which means he wants to be really close to me, but doesn't actually want to be touched very much. And 
He yells at me all the time. Turns out he has an ear infection now that we know. But he's been yelling, like barking for days, trying to tell us something. And I've been trying to figure out what it is. But he doesn't have words to communicate it. So yeah, he's anyone who says pet parents <laughs> do not experience parenthood is so wrong. Because it's basically like, I've raised four children. Two of them I made myself. It is the same as having a toddler, except they never grow up and they never learn our language. We have to learn theirs. So I think compassion is part of that. And seeing it reflected from these creatures or plants or, I mean, I feel like everything has an energy to it. So being sensitive to that or being open to that does reflect back to me when I need to be compassionate to myself. And so I brought up the dog because I have a lot of work to do. And Tuesday, I decided if I don't lay down, he's not going to lay down. He will not rest. He's had some pain relief. He's had like even a sedative so that he could like at least calm down because you're not going to heal if you don't rest. So I laid in bed and he wrapped his body around me just like a little kid. And he slept and I read, we rested together. But yeah, sometimes I need my dog or my child or something else outside of me to remind me that it's okay to take care of myself too. Yeah, which is so great. I feel like living and doing activity that I love is also taking care of myself. I don't want it to seem like here I am like, you know, in the drudgery of things because I do feel like doing is definitely a way that I care for myself as well. Yes, totally. But not doing is what I'm learning. Totally. Leaving because, space for magic to come to me instead yes. of always making it myself. You know? Yes. That's the thing with self-love, right? And I know sometimes when we hear self-love, it's like, ugh, it's like, it's kind of a buzzy thing, I feel like. But I never feel that way. It, oh, good. But self-love, right? Sometimes we forget to make time for ourselves or it could feel like we're being selfish and it's okay to be selfish and being selfish could be, I need to take a nap and do nothing. It could also be that I'm okay. I'm going to keep go, go, going because I am loving what I'm doing. Acknowledging that and actually being okay with it. Well, and you and I as six lines, especially, but everyone who is in connection with one another. And if you think you're not connected to anybody, where have you been the past three years? Because whether we like it or not, we are connected to everyone in our lives. The virus showed us that. It didn't discriminate. Taking care of ourselves literally is taking care of each other. Making sure that we protected our you know, breathing and making sure that we stayed home when we weren't feeling well and hopefully still doing that. All of those things can seem selfish. Like, oh, I have to take another day off of work. Like, you know, my poor coworkers are going to have to pick up the slack. Well, you're also not getting them sick. So I can't feel like any self-care is selfish. It might be indulgent and there's a place for that too. Yeah. But truly selfish? No, just like I don't feel like there's any, here we are in an ethics class, but I don't feel like there's any absolute altruism either because we get something from it. Our motivations might not be to get something from it, but there's no, here I've sacrificed this and there's nothing in it for me because if you have your eyes open while you have your hands open, you'll see that you get some satisfaction. You get some, I mean, the love we feel is the love coming out of us. Mm -hmm. It's not something from outside. So the more we love, the more we share, the more we give, the more love we feel. I mean, what's more selfish than that? Like wanting mm -hmm. to feel love and yeah. doing everything we can to feel that way. Yeah. I am just popping in really quick to first just say thanks for being here, for being a community member of the Life Activated Podcast. Without you, there would truly be no podcast. And you are the inspiration for everything that happens on this podcast for all of the guests that come through. And what would be so amazing and so helpful is if you could take a moment, if you feel called to rate and review the podcast, let us know what you think, 
by rating and reviewing the podcast, you help other people to find it. If you are really loving the podcast and you want to make sure that you never miss a season or an episode, you're going to want to subscribe and share with your friends. Let them know. Don't keep it a secret. I appreciate you so much for being a part of the Life Activated community. Talk to you soon. And I would also add the sort of reflection of that too is you have to be able to receive in order yes. to give. And it's a, definitely a cycle. Yeah. You can't just give. You, yeah. That's why I said you have to have your eyes open when exactly. you have your hands open. You have to have your heart open when you have your hands exactly. open too, because if you're closed off to that, then exactly. that is, um, I guess what I meant was in a healthy outlook, or at least what I think is healthy would be that we are constantly in relationship with one another. Exactly. Exactly. The piece to that I would love to hear from you is how do you manage through that without judgment? Because I think especially oh. for w- women, that's a big struggle, right? Like feeling like guilt and judging ourselves for all the things that we want to do <laughs> or feeling selfish, even though right. we know it's important to take care of ourselves. How or, do not, you... or feeling like a failure if we can't do the 48 yeah. million ideas we had before breakfast. Yes. And yes. then we forget to eat breakfast. And yeah. then we wonder why we're tired and can't do four of yeah. those things in a day. What's selfish about me there is that I have not stopped myself from being ambitious in the mornings. The part that I have developed over the past couple of years, especially, you know, I have this studio, you've been here. It's my own space. It's filled with my own energy and having a place to get away from the, ex- I mean, it's tucked away. It's a gem. There's like a secret garden here. I mean, it, it's, it's beautiful. Amazing. I mean, there's a, a big public path nearby, but there's no, like, it's not a retail it's still space. A surprising it's, it's space. You yeah. know, when you come in, that's mm-hmm. where the sparkles are. The outside yeah. is kind of plain, almost in disguise. No like one would know universe. it's there. Yeah. 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 And that is definitely how I allow myself to have compassion for myself, mm-hmm. is that I can get some perspective here when I'm only in my own energy, when I don't have the expectations of others, whether they're you know my beloveds in my family or my perceived others out in the world. It's very selfish of me to say this, but the pandemic has been good for me in that Mm -hmm. way. I love being with people. I get so much joy and energy uh, around being with people, but I've really learned who I am in these past Mm -hmm. few years. And it's been a lot of self-inquiry to find out who that is. And to my relief and delight, I am who I thought I was. So I think we can be afraid. Of that, we can be afraid of looking into our shadows and looking into who we might really be, and that's yeah. the judgment part you're talking about. Like, what are people going to think? Mm-hmm. I say I don't care. I mean, I care in that I want to have a an impact on people that allows them to carry forth whatever they get from me into the world. I don't care about people's opinions about me that are just different from mine. Exactly. I did. I don't anymore. I wouldn't get anything done at all if I thought about that. I don't have room for that. My brain is so full. No, none of us have room for that. And it could be an element of age. It could just be an element of the forced sort of situation of the time of the pandemic. But to get to the point of basically not giving a shit about it to be able to be who you are. Yeah. That is what we want to get to. And that's what I want for everybody. Exactly. Even if they wouldn't be somebody who would get along with me or, I mean, it's hard to imagine actually, but (laughs) so curious. Um, I probably irritate people, but I can definitely get along with them. Even people who have different priorities or who value different things. I can still see it's back to this. Like, where can I find something, some common ground? Where can I find something to be as human as possible yeah. with other people? And so judgment is part of that. We need discernment. We need discrimination, not 
discrimination as in prejudice and racism. I mean, discrimination as in being able to discriminate between what is good for us and what is not. Mm-hmm. To evaluate, to be open-minded and look at sides, different facets of a situation. There aren't two sides. There are a million sides and each is nuanced and we can't possibly know what those are, but being open to different ways to look at things is a mission in life, I think. To learn as much as possible, to be as human as possible. I don't think you can do that without judgment. And right. sometimes that's judging ourselves and then releasing ourselves from that judgment. That whole process, it doesn't have to be public. It doesn't have to affect the way we are in the world, but having space. So I say I don't rest, but like, this is my rest, like allowing these emotions to come up and dissipate and release them. That's a kind of rest. That's mm-hmm. a kind of emotional rest mm-hmm. or psychological rest that took practice. And sometimes it requires yoga poses and sometimes it requires you know, meditation. Sometimes it requires sweat and exercise. Sometimes it requires listening to an audiobook and getting lost in a fictional world and yeah. allowing that emotion to kind of affect me in a good way or listening to sad songs so that I can clear out whatever grief is there with me or just feel understood by music. There are so many ways, but I don't think pretending that there's a way to not have judgment toward ourselves or others is one of them. Yeah. Not for me. Yeah. Right now. The human condition. We're human right now, right? This is like the human world that we live in. So that is just Earth like, school. we got to yeah. get there. <laughs> Earth school. You know, I want to enjoy it. I'm not here to just like learn my lessons and mark them off on the chalkboard no. in the sky. <laughs> no, we, this is a journey. Literally, life is a journey. I have another question for you. Yeah, of course. I would love to know when recently have you felt out of alignment and can you remember what it's felt like or like how did you know i have a condition when i a uh, physical condition i mean they call it a neurological and physical condition but it could just be intuition my skin hurts It's called neuropathy. I have pain. I feel like my arms mostly are on fire. It comes from like this when my my shoulders are clenched up and my upper back. I start to feel like very hot. My skin is still cool to the touch. It's not a fever. It's not like my multi, super multi fire signs burning inside of me. It is my nerve endings being unable to, you know, soothe themselves. And I feel it physically when I'm out of alignment. I mean, it was an absolute decision to be who I say I am and always say who I'm being uh, Mm -hmm. to make sure that my inner and outer selves are the same Yeah, because it's so hard to carry a facade. As much as we talk about embracing archetypes and stepping into that, that is not being a different person at work than you are at home. That is embodying different qualities that are already inherent in you. And we have every archetype available to us. So it's not pretending you're someone else. It might be being inspired by someone else to put that on. And if I am, you know, embracing an archetype that feels out of alignment, it's situational. It's not that it's out of alignment with me. And if it is, then maybe there are some things I need to work on in myself in order to be able to wear that, in order to invite others in or to invite different ways of thinking in for me alone in my studio even. When a specific time I felt out of alignment, the beginning of the year, I took on a job that I thought was going to be straightforward. I mean, the kind of thing I could do with one hand tied behind my back. Every time I went another layer deeper into the project, there was another piece of information that was missing. And I felt Mm -hmm. this weird shame for not knowing that in advance. And It was taking too long. And the way I have my business set up, I wasn't able to invoice because I didn't have a thing to show for it, even though 98% of the things I do are invisible because they're all engineering and thought and figuring out problems in the background and um, considering multiple iterations of the same thing so that it can embrace a wide variety of body shapes and genders and changing the language around how we interact with the people who make clothing and who at home and So this project was a a sewing pattern project. 
there was no size chart. The patterns I got did not match the samples. They And, you know, it wasn't the designer's fault. They didn't know what they didn't know either. And so I felt very torn and I felt very prickly, um, mm. not in my heart, but like my skin felt yeah. like it was on fire, yeah. burning until I was able to take that information. And here's where now I have this passion for starting how we mean to begin. So the next work I take on, there's a requirement to have an assessment period with me and it's paid. And if we decide to work together, that goes toward your project. If we don't, then you have all the information you need to have a successful start with someone else, or if I don't have time, or if, you know, somebody would rather do something more locally, that's totally fine because then there's an equal exchange. And I would not have come to this conclusion if, if I wasn't feeling that friction. And sometimes it requires that I wear softer clothes. And like there is a kind of cocoon I have to give myself when I'm having that neuropathy. There's nothing I can drink or, yeah, uh, maybe I could not drink caffeine, but I only drink one cup of coffee a day these days. Like, why would I deny myself that? Because that in itself is not going to fix my neuropathy issue. The coming into alignment is what repairs that. And so it took a couple months and that's a long time for me to feel uncomfortable yeah. in general, because I usually am pretty quick to see or at least intuitively know what needs to change, even if I can't name it. But this was a rough one. It was like almost identity changing because it felt like a giant failure for not being able to know something I couldn't possibly have known. And so that out of alignment wasn't with the project. It wasn't with the client. I'm so excited that we still get to work together. I love what they're doing in the world. I'm so excited to bring it to people. But yeah, that friction inside me was causing me to be unable to move forward, even on technical things. I couldn't even make yeah. a template because I didn't feel like, what if I do this and then I find something else that's wrong and I have to like reverse engineer everything. And yeah, it took me a lot of work to kind of peel back the layers to find out at its core, I need to change the way I start projects with people. Yeah, it was like understanding what is out of alignment with how you originate your large business projects. Right. And even small ones, because yeah. everything needs to be in place for it to be. You know, my mm -hmm. prices for our flat rate, because I want to be able to give people, if it takes a little longer to figure something out, they shouldn't have to be punished for that price-wise. And also I price so that I kind of anticipate a little bit of that anyway, because everything even though it seems like it should be a repeatable process, I told you in the beginning, there are not standards in this industry. And so there is a little bit of nuance that's different to each project. But yeah, realizing that there actually needed to be a firm assessment at the beginning that was communicated and that that's an opportunity to educate and learn from the client um, what they need or what their customers need. And then I could educate what is needed in order to complete these projects. And so whether I create it from scratch, which is what ended up happening, or we go out and find it, or they go to resources that they have that they didn't think I needed or didn't know, that feels so good now. And I'm excited to start new things in that way. But I wouldn't have gotten there without that friction. So even though it was a rough few months, I feel like it was, in the end, it's paved or smoothed out the way. Yeah. And helping you in your business. In and maybe help future. other people to not have to go through that. That's the whole right. journey of the 6-3 in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> Professional mistake maker. I make mistakes so you don't have to. Not the right. same ones anyway. You can make mistakes and tell me about them and I will also learn from those. But accepting that that is part of my job here on earth is to make these mistakes or like find the friction or learn yeah, you're always learning. Learn my lessons. Yeah. Accepting mm -hmm. that. I could mope and say that, why does everything have to be so hard? Why don't I ever get to, you know, have anything easy? Would I want something easy? No. If I wanted something easy, I would go work for someone else. Instead, right. I want to inspire people to be able to take their ideas and share them. The one question for you with Jean Keys. I know you love Jean Keys. And I mentioned in the last season, I mentioned a little bit about Gene Keys and I had sort of teased that I knew someone who was going to be here who's a Gene Keys goddess, which was you. Oh, the goddess, just a guy. <laughs> Some four steps in front of me. 
And I'm t- hopefully I'm getting the rocks out of the path you might trip on. So when someone were to look at Jinkies, if you could tell us sort of what is Jinkies in terms of a, you know, sort of tool for understanding ourselves, you know, I sort of was talking about, you know, how there's so many different tools out there. You've got astrology, you've got um, human design. We were actually talking about like disc even and like, Mm -hmm. you know, success factors. There's so many different tools, whether it's from the quote unquote corporate world to the woo world of understanding. Right. Of understanding who we are. Tell us a little bit about like Gene Keys. Founder of Gene Keys is a man named Richard Red. He was a student of the person who brought human design to us. Gene Keys is like a more contemplative, poetic, kind of built in compassionate way to look at the gifts and archetypes that we we're born having ready access to. I said earlier, and I meant it, that we have access to all archetypes. You know, we, we talk about astrology and there's, you know, the memification of astrology, like people even being able to say their star signs or sun signs in a corporate meeting is hilarious to me because there's no way I would have said that when I worked at Ford Motor Company in 2001. But it's so fun to be able to talk about these things casually and also there are ways to dive deeper. So it's not just a surface level. I love that Gene Keys is so flexible and yeah. that, yes, it's complex, but even just looking at the profile is a beautiful set of geometry. And so even just feeling that beauty in the structure, to me, it speaks to me. I mean, I also, you know, I can feel music. I guess I'm just going to have to admit that I have some kind of synesthesia because I understand music differently from other people. And I understand some structures differently from other people. And I have different requirements for how I can function smoothly. And sometimes that means I have to have complete silence. And sometimes that means like everything I need has to be out on a table with me. So we probably all have those. I've just paid attention to what I need and have allowed myself to not judge it, you know, allowed myself to experiment with these things. I feel like because every sphere in Gene Keys is something that we should be familiar with because these are archetypes that are in our astrology. They're in our human design, if you know human design, and it allows us to go a little deeper. I found that learning Gene Keys made me go back to astrology and love it more. It made Uh me learn the I Ching and love it too. It made me go back to human design. And instead of being frustrated because I felt like when I was introduced to it, I say many years ago, I mean, like five years ago was a different galaxy, a different world, a different plane, I feel like, than we're living on right now, or at least I am. The conversation around it has changed. So human design also has more compassion and some people are even like changing the language around it so that it can, so we can see ourselves in it instead of judging ourselves by what one man translated as what he understood. And so Gene Keys to me feels a little more living in that way, gotcha. maybe because the person who, you know, articulated for us is still here, like making mistakes and changing the way we interact with it and participating as a student when he does retreats, like he has other people lead it. And he's like in the breakout rooms with people. He's in just participating and learning. When you said like, he doesn't really say how he downloaded it. I love that because you know how I don't talk about saying like, oh, I channeled that or I downloaded Mm -hmm. that. It's one of those things that kind of like drives me crazy sometimes around our spiritual world, especially when people can be really flip around saying, oh, I just channeled that or I just downloaded that because I feel very strongly that it is a responsibility that we have. And so if you are flip about saying I channeled that or downloaded that, and by the way, we could all channel, we could all, we all get downloads. It's how it's being said, right? And so Mm -hmm. it's just even the fact that he is mindful about how he communicates and doesn't like to necessarily say he downloaded, like it's an awareness sometimes, right? My last question to you is, you know, something that as I've been finding that I don't do enough of, and I feel like as women, we don't do enough of, is celebrating ourselves. So Mm. what are ways or how do you celebrate yourself? The way I celebrate myself is every moment I discover something new, I allow myself to be amazed. 
amazed that this human creature was able to either figure this out or allow it to come through me. And I don't take ownership over the things that come through me. They're not mine. I'm here to allow things to come through me. That's all. That's Just like every idea I have isn't for me. Things I make with my hands. Yeah, I've honored the skill that I've created over practicing things and making a lot of mistakes and discovering new ways to do things and allowing there to be multiple right answers. I allow that to be a celebration. I just allow myself to be amazed. That is so beautiful. Harold. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me here. Oh my goodness. Next time we'll do it in person. Uh, I don't like you being so far away. What are you like 20 miles away? I know. 14 miles away. We We can literally walk. Well, it would be slow, but it would be be real hell slow. Yeah. 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 So tell people who are listening how they can find you. They can go to my website, karenlepage.me. For now, I'm playing around on Instagram, but it's all fun experiment. And when I don't like it, I don't show up. So um, the best way is to come to my website. I have a class where you can teach yourself how to sew from not knowing how to thread a needle to making a sewing pattern for a garment that you're going to wear within four weeks. You can take your time, but it's designed for four weeks called Sewing is Magic. And it's a completely self-paced course now. I also offer Gene Keys exploration sessions, and I'm going to start breaking them down so they can be a little more in-depth, not just the overview. Because I think some people, you know, you get the overview, but then you can also, we can work together on just separate parts of it. And explorejeankeys.com is how you can get there, but that's also it just points to a page on my on my main website too. Okay, awesome. I have two different portals on my website, professional and personal. And so that would be under personal services. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh. I love it. All right. That does it for this episode of the Life Activated Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Please do subscribe to the show rank and review the podcast. Five-star reviews go a long way. Let me know that you've done so. Send me a message on LinkedIn or Instagram with a screenshot and I will personally reach out to you to thank you. Send me a message letting me know what you think about the show and definitely check out the show notes for additional resources to support you with this season. 